So when we think about secondary reinforcers, means there's a primary reinforcer. <laughs> primary reinforcers are things like food and air and water and procreation. And, and so primary reinforcers are things that they intrinsically like without anyone having to teach them these things. This is not something that they've learned. This is something that they just like. So that's a primary, also known as an unconditioned reinforcer. Something they find reinforcing, something they like. Now, they already have things, that, and then there's secondary or conditioned reinforcers. This is things they've learned to like, whether it be organically through, you know, their mom or through the world, or, or it's something we set out to train. And it is a tool, having secondary reinforcers is really important piece of the positive reinforcement. Because there's times we want to build duration on behavior. Or I use this example, like in the sea lion and otter show, there could be up to 150 behaviors a show. And so you can't feed all of those. But what we did find is if we did not bridge them for their right criteria, their correct, the desired criteria, we tended to have frustration and slipping criteria. So if we bridge them, we use the, we didn't use a clicker because we didn't call it clicker training, but if we bridge them and told them they did a good job, yet followed it up with a secondary reinforcer because we couldn't feed 150 behaviors in the show, we kept the criteria high, we kept the attitude good, we had them, you know, feeling good about things and kept everything kind of moving and fun. So the utilizing the secondary reinforcers was imperative. And it, it was so normal for me that I didn't, I never thought much about it. You know, I just, we use secondary reinforcers. We would bridge them, they come back and we'd rub them down or we'd put them in the water or we'd ask them to, yeah, that'd be a sea lion. <laughs> we, we would have them sit on their podium. Or we would have them, you know, whatever it is, we would have secondary reinforcers that we do. We'd rub their tongue, we'd play with their, you know, flippers, whatever it was. But we had conditioned reinforcers, things, and some of these things only become conditioned because we've done them so many times that classic conditioning has come up behind it and given it value. And they think, ooh, I just love this. You know, the podium for the sea lions is a really good example because they spent so much of their time sitting on their podium. And that was the gateway to doing other things. So there's, so recognizing that is really important, but we can set out to teach and classically condition secondary reinforcers. And so it's a really great tool to use, but it takes some, deal, some due diligence to really build the reinforcement history behind it or the association. So when it has a really good, strong association, it means it has really good emotions. When we've done it with a positive reinforcement and they tend to think, oh, I love getting in the trailer. Why wouldn't I get in the trailer? Good things happen with the trailer. I like the trailer. They don't necessarily think after some time has been part of it, they don't think you owe me because I got in the trailer. But, but it's important that we have worked on conditioning things. So teaching horses at tactile, some horses like tactile. Henley does. Henley tends, but the, even then there's certain days she's like, don't. <laughs> but but mostly, she just loves to be rubbed. And all it is is a matter of finding where it is today. She's just very itchy little gal, and she loves that. So I can utilize that. But I still back it up with food to strengthen it for a while until it can stand alone. So now, Minty, on the other hand, he was all positive reinforcement, but tactile to him. He was a thoroughbred with really sensitive chestnut skin. He was really sensitive to things. There are things that you could put on other horses. You couldn't with him. So giving him a good rub down wasn't necessarily something he loved. There's times of year when he would be shedding that he liked it more than others. And I would build that up as a reinforcer, but it was not something that was historically part of something he liked. So I turned it into a conditioned reinforcer. Here's another thing I turned into a conditioned reinforcer because this is my own little problem. <laughs> <laughs> I love kissing their noses. Okay, so most horses are like, whatever, you can do that. I don't really care. Well, Murray came along and Murray was decidedly not liking that. That was invasive. That was too much in his space. And I thought, I am this habit of mine, I, it's going to be easier to teach him to like it than it is going to be to break the habit. So what I did is I set out to classically condition that. So I set out to turn this thing that was in the beginning, not only neutral, it was aversive. 
he didn't like it. So what I do is I touch his face, I click and reinforce. I touch his face, I click and reinforce. Touch his face, click and reinforce. Touch two sides of the face, click and reinforce. This side, this side, this side, this side. Till so he's like, I'm all good with that. And it was very clear. And then pretty soon I would come in a little closer, a little closer until eventually I could kiss his nose. Till pretty soon he would come up, like kiss my face or can I put my head in your chest? And so I taught him to not only tolerate it, but so I turned it from not only bad to neutral to it being something he loved and it actually was a conditioned reinforcer. So for a lot of my horses, hugging their head, rubbing their head, stroking their head, kissing their noses has become something that I've reinforced so heavily that it is a conditioned reinforcer. So there's other things we can do and utilize as part of the training where we can utilize conditioned reinforcers. Now here's an important component. When I, when I first started working in the horse world, I, now positive reinforcement was very, very new with horses. So it was further along, I mean, with, with dogs. So it was, the dog world was further along than the horse world, but it was still a new concept and it had a long way to go, which it has come a long way now. So it is now much more accepted, but I would go to demos and my horses, there were my horses that knew me inside now. I knew all their tics. I could ask them to do something and I may click, but I'd follow it up with a secondary reinforcer. And one of the things that can become secondary reinforcers are very well established behaviors. You know, when your horse starts kind of throwing behaviors at you, they're, they're soliciting your attention by, by offering behaviors. Typically they're picking the behaviors that are their favorite behaviors, the ones that have the strongest reinforcement history. So as we get to that point in time, they're telling us this is now something to me that says the odds are getting reinforced are very great, meaning it's really slipping into the becoming a conditioned reinforcer. So I would use conditioned reinforcers. I would use behaviors behind my click and, and not be using food. I was using secondary reinforcers and people would come up all the time and say, you're not allowed to do that. And I'd be like, I spent 10 years, you know, training remembers. I think we do that. You know, I knew we did it, but it had become somehow been perceived as some rule. So, and even in my book, I originally, in the original video, I said I wasn't reinforcing. Sometimes I didn't reinforce after a click. I am reinforcing. I'm not reinforcing with food. The nuances of that, people are ready for it to be pulled apart and to understand that more. Back then, it was so rudimentary and just trying to get anybody to understand positive reinforcement was really the biggest task, let alone how to do it. Now we have much more acceptance and it's time to work out a lot of those nuances that, that takes a mediocre trainer to, to be a great trainer. What, what things do we apply that take it from just getting stuff done to building that true relationship and looking at, at the, what's below the water at the, with the iceberg, you know? So I think of operant conditioning is this top part. This is a part of the iceberg we see. This is how we train stuff. This is, this is positive, negative reinforcement all up here. This is, the tip of the iceberg. But as I started working with the horses, I started looking under the surface, I would see this mass, massive body down there, meaning the, the bottom of the iceberg. I didn't even know what I was looking at. It was so big at first, but now I can see that and I can see it clearly. And really what it is, it's the emotional state. And how do we create the relationship, the bond? How do we get you know, the, the reinforcement history to be so strong that they're going to do, th you know, it's just, it's, it's huge. It's just ginormous. And part of utilizing the secondary reinforcers to do it successfully, you need to have really established a good relationship and change their perspective for, from one of pessimism and stranger danger and neophobic new things equal danger to one where they start going, what is that? and their curiosity involved. So it takes a big switch. But when we start to use secondary reinforcers, we tend to not use them as much when we have a new behavior that we haven't sorted out the criteria yet, a new behavior that perhaps just isn't understood yet. If they're struggling with a piece of it, we're building duration or we're asking them to do it in a new place, you know, context shift. And so all of these things where we may have compromised criteria, I go back to really strong food reinforcement. And, and so that we can maintain those and, and there is inherent stress and learning. Let's just put that out there. 
So what we want to do is teach them to be problem solvers, to like the learning. And that means what we need to do is, is have them wanting to play the game, have them loving to learn, have them feeling confident about learning. So that is all part of that. So utilizing secondary reinforcers is an advanced concept. It is to come judiciously, you know, down the pike with, with other things. And it takes a certain amount of awareness to recognize when to use the secondary reinforcers. But they're a huge part of building duration. They're a huge part of, of carrying on. It's a huge part of the observation and behavior analysis as well. So that is my little spiel about secondary reinforcers. They're really important, but they are for the advanced, more advanced learner, for the more advanced trainer, and for the more well-established behaviors as we're taking them from being a new behavior, we want to move them into the area where it is secondary reinforcer, where it is classically conditioned and holds its own value.